What is up, wrestling fans, and welcome to the latest edition of the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast here on the Smile Cat Moment channel. It's episode 27 and the final episode of 2002, so joining me, Callum Wiggins, on this journey back in time, as per usual, is Robert DeFelice. Callum, first of all, Merry Christmas yesterday. Merry Christmas right. to you as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot here. Do you happen to remember anything of what you got for Christmas in 2002? Ooh, 2002. Did the PS2 come out in 2002? Uh, the PS2 came out in 2000. Ah, uh, maybe, yeah, it probably would have been. Oh, to be fair, I don't think I got it, like, immediately afterwards, so it might have been one of my presents where I got there. I imagine it would have been something like that and some PlayStation 2-related games. Um, so I can tell you for certain, if this is December 2002, I am playing Dragon Ball Z Budokai, which I just got for Christmas, and I also got Mario Party 4 on the GameCube. Wow. I've never actually owned a Mario Party game. Yeah, they stopped being good after four. <laughs> That's bit, fair enough. It's like um, it's annoying because you have like the um, I, I saw the ones on the Switch version they have now, and it's like, well, that's great, but you know how everyone just plays games online nowadays, and you don't have an online. You don't have an online party mode. It's really, really does make a mistake. Yeah, that's won't talk about that much too much because way back in two thousand two, nobody even knew what the Switch was or. That's right. Re- really, like, didn't really have too much experience of, besides the Game Boy about having handheld games anyway, so I think yeah. we've gone a long way since then, but we're back in 2002 here in the episode 27, the um, final episode of this year, before we move on to our final stretch of 2003, a couple of months still to go, but hopefully you've been enjoying this series so far if you've been listening along with us, of course, if you are listening to us and watching on YouTube then do drop a like, leave a comment below, do any other great stuff that you can do on the YouTube platform, except hit the dislike button, because that's not nice. That's right. Uh, not nice at all. Not, uh, especially at Christmas, that'd be rude. Um, obviously, if you're listening to us for any of the other podcast feeds, like iTunes or Stitcher, then drop a rating or a review or anything else you can do there to let us know that you're enjoying what we're doing, let other people know that you're enjoying it as well, because maybe they'll listen to it as well. Obviously, there is a playlist on the YouTube channel as well, so you can go back all the way back to episode zero or episode one and start your journey all the way through. Maybe you've got some spare time over Christmas and you want to get caught up on everything. That's the place to go. And there is a link in the description to this episode of SmackDown on the WWE Network if you haven't watched it in advance or would like to watch it afterwards, whatever floats your boat. So we're a few like little bits and pieces out of the way. Let's talk about some news from this point in time. And really, it's only one piece of news because... Maybe uh, the Observer was taking it a bit easier over the holiday period because there wasn't really much of any real interest that I read in there, except for another wrestling-related autobiography coming out. We've spoken about that quite, quite a lot, I think. Is it Ric Flair? It's not Ric Flair this time. It's um, Jerry the King Lawler. Oh, it's going to be the king. Sometimes. Yeah, it's good. Exactly. I'm g- glad you know the title. Um, essentially... Um, I obviously haven't read the book from cover to cover or anything like that, but Meltzer's review that he gives in The Observer basically gives the impression that it's one of the more brutally honest and entertaining books in this like recent catalogue of wrestler biographies. Certainly a lot more than Piper's and Hogan's. I was going to say, Waller strikes me as a guy who would just tell the truth. You know, like he just strikes me as somebody who wouldn't hide anything for better or worse, you know? Yeah, it includes a lot of stuff about his uh, time in the Memphis Territory, and he's not, like, he doesn't, like, shy away from the fact that he was the biggest star in Memphis for a time, but he also doesn't suggest that everything that happened in Memphis was great and everything that he was involved with was great as well. Has lengthy discussions about his feud with Andy Kaufman, all the stuff surrounding that when he came to WWE. Um, the book, I think people I, need to understand, because I know nowadays Lawler's been in WWE nearly 30 years, at this point, he was in WWE for less than a decade. Really, his entire career was the Memphis Territory. Yeah. The book also notes a few interesting little tidbits I saw from the Observer Review. It notes that Lawler kind of considered his son Brian as more more as like a fellow wrestler in the locker room than he did his son. That doesn't surprise me at all. Did that surprise you? Yeah. He also got a vasectomy when he was 23 years old. Yep. And he tried to get it reversed, and it failed to failed to reverse it. So, essentially, he's been, I guess, for one of a better word, sterile since the age of 23. Obviously, which, he had two kids prior to that. Which might be a reason as to why he has been the way he is. Like, 
yeah, he kind of he kind of holds it as a um, a key factor in why his second marriage broke up, and obviously his third marriage was with the cat. That didn't last too little, long. Yeah, it talks a little bit about that. Um, the last few chapters also make it like this painfully apparent Frank story about how Lawler struggles to come to terms with the fact that he's no longer like in his twenties or thirties or even forties, and he can't just it feels more odd or difficult to go up to young women now and it feels a little bit more i don't say creepy but it just feels a bit weird to do that at his age now but he still feels kind of a compulsion to do it that again brutally honest i'd love to hear a jerry Lawler like tell all just put a camera in front of him for like five hours let him just say everything because what you just said right there kind of surprises me that he acknowledges that it's a little scummy and he feels a little creepy you know yeah i guess there is part of it that he feels like a little bit creepy it's also just a part of him that just feels like he struggles to come to term with aging and yeah like there's, there's a lot of people that fall into that trap obviously the midlife crisis thing stuff like that but it's it's quite like i think he was encouraged by jim ross to write some more stuff about his relationship with women that maybe he was initially gonna write in there so ross thought it'd be a good idea or like it would be more revealing or more a, a complete it's gonna be cathartic you know like that yeah. seems very healthy which is not something i usually think of when i think of jerry lawler's relationship with women no i'm sure there'll be a few more um pay-per-views coming up where we'll have certain things to say we're just like rolling our eyes at um some of his um depictions of the female members of the roster at the very least yeah but speaking of which let's talk a little bit about what raw was up to so, of course, we started the ratings war. Unsurprisingly, SmackDown wins again. Um, so this is the final episode of the year for SmackDown. A day after Christmas, scored 3.9, which is actually up from the previous week. So that's actually pretty good. Seriously. I'm going to lead that to it's the day after Christmas. Mm-hmm. More people are home. Maybe like, you know, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's keep playing with our toys and watch SmackDown or whatever. I think that probably helped them at this time, as opposed to, like, running on Christmas Day this year. You know, that doesn't help them. Yeah, in comparison to the December 23rd edition of Raw, which scored a 3.3 rating. Um, it's going to be slightly different next week. Obviously, we'll cover that as well. But as they noted on the SmackDown episode today, Raw next week isn't an episode of Raw. It's a clip show. Yeah, and I think that's good. Yeah, they yeah. just do a review of like some of the better matches from 2002, some matches from pay per view. Like they'll do the the Rock versus Hulk Hogan. Now I'm assuming they'll be not. That I've gone back and watched this uh, clip show version, but I assume they'll do the TLC ladder match from a couple of weeks ago and stuff like that. That just fill out the fill out. Yeah, the, I uh, imagine show. it'll be like that. Uh, the, the Shawn Michaels stuff, maybe Edge, uh, Edge, maybe Eddie Guerrero and Van Dam from early in the year. Mm. Yeah, so let's um so I guess we're talking about really the final roar itself of the year, so let's see what happens. So in the main event segment it was Scott Steiner defeating Triple H in arm wrestling. You know what? This is my favorite, favorite, favorite segment from that whole rivalry. Triple H is overacting at his best i want to be rick flair in 1985 at his best in this segment yeah so obviously due to triple h's uh, most recent injury he's not able to wrestle until a lot closer to the rumble so they use this opportunity to fill the gaps in with other segments like this arm wrestling there's a a pose down segment in a couple of weeks and a push-up segment as well so basically they're doing everything they can to have these two interact with each other without actually fighting each other I think it worked. You know, like, it's... Let me put it like this. It's a different feud. Triple H does not have a feud like this at any other point in his career. Like, I guess... Uh, well, go ahead. Like, considering, the, um, considering the way that it ended up, I guess it was probably for the best that they didn't touch each other prior to the Royal Rumble. Well, that is true. But, like, if you think about the average Triple H feud, it's a lot of matches, right? And a lot of tag mm-hmm. matches, maybe some mind games. Now, this is... This is the closest thing I think Triple H has ever done to just doing, like, a sports entertainment feud. I can even see Hulk Hogan having a feud like this. So I did say that was main event. Actually, the main event match of the show was... Well, if I were to tell you the show was in Oklahoma, what would you, who would you assume be in the main event? Jim Ross doing something ridiculous. 
Yeah, so the main event was Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross teaming up to take on Lance Storm and William Regal. Is this the one where Bischoff kicks the cinder block into his head? No, it's not. It's um, So Bischoff basically said that they would have to have a match tonight because he was doing stuff with Chief Morley. Him and Chief Morley were on commentary for this match. And what happens is the Dudley boys interfere. There's like ref bumps and all this other stuff. Uh, Jim Ross then hits William Regal in the head with brass knuckles when the referee's down. He pins William Regal. So, the t- so basically the tag team they're building up to be like the big heel tag team at the moment who were on a big re- winning run. And spoiler alert, will be tag team champions in a couple of weeks' time. Loses to Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross by, by being pinned by Jim Ross. I'm legitimately surprised that they never put the tag titles on Lawler and JR. Because they went through, like, a phase Mm. where, like, JR was having a match at least once or twice a year. I believe we won't get there because it's Unforgiven 03. But don't they have, like, a pay-per-view match? Yeah, it's um, they have a pay-per-view match in Unforgiven 2003, like you said. Uh, It's um, Lawler and King, not Lawler and King, Lawler and Ross against uh, Coachman and Al Snow with the winning team getting the, um, the commentary spot on Raw. And, That's and so uh, weird, man. Yeah, and spoiler, they lost that one. But then Ross had a match with Jonathan Coachman a couple of weeks later on Raw and won it back for them. Yeah. But, yeah so Ross was, Ross was wrestling every now and again, it seemed to be. Um, even though he had, if you were to watch this match back, which I did, just to out of morbid curiosity, it would be, um, um, you could see why he doesn't wrestle that often because he's not a wrestler and he's not very coordinated even for a, just a regular human being. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Um, it was funny, also, that um, Bischoff mentioned um, when he was uh, bad-mouthing uh, Lawler and Ross at the start of the show, he mentions uh, Tony Schiavone by name. Huh. As well, so, Tony Schiavone getting a mention on this uh, this episode. Yeah, that is not typical. Like, Schiavone is out of the picture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Booker T and Goldust defended their tag team championships against Chris Jericho and Christian. So, they're... Rain is um, continuing, at least for the short term. Uh, Trish Stratus, Stacey Keebler, and Jack uh, Jacqueline defeated Victoria, Ivory, and Molly Holly in a Santa's Little Helper match. Uh, well, I was going to say, why would, they're putting Stacey in the ring, but it's because she's going to wear a Santa's Little Helper outfit and show off those legs. Did you know that she has legs? Yes. I've been told that once or twice. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been um, reliably informed that she knows how to use them as well. Correct. Uh, Kane and RBD defeated a three minute warning who are basically just losing every week at this point <laughs> and, uh, but it was a change up this week because three minute warning after losing decided they were going to attack Rico because Rico was the problem all along I would agree with that statement as a blanket statement I would agree that I think Rico was the problem at three minute warning and Batista squashed by Dudley to, to continue his kind of push and I think part of, the, um, part of that was based around the idea of um, them not like the Dudley boys helping Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler were kind of like a byproduct of Dwight Dudley being beaten up by Batista. I, I think the rise of Batista, and I said this here before, is one of the picture perfect examples of how to build somebody. Well, let's move on to an episode of SmackDown from December 26, 2002, from the Tulsa Convention Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I'm surprised Oklahoma. that Raw and SmackDown are touring that close together in terms of venues. I would use them to, like, conquer the country at different ends. Yeah, potentially. Maybe it was just a travel thing, just trying to limit the amount they were going to. Maybe it's the idea of, like, we'll put them in one place, they can all go back to their uh, places for Christmas and stuff like that. I'm not sure how it would have worked, but just suffice to say, they are in Oklahoma tonight, but obviously because there's no Jim Ross on SmackDown, and as far as I'm aware, there's nobody from Oklahoma on the SmackDown roster. No. If they are, we don't know about it because Oklahoma belongs to JR. Absolutely. So we have another long opening video package. This second week, it's been like three minutes long, this opening package. Yeah, like it kills he... time, brother. Yeah, no, but it's just like the show's only, like, realistically, when you take away the advertising, it's only just over an hour and 20 minutes long, and it's like three minutes is dedicated to just one video package at the start of it. It feels like, again, again, it feels like Raw nowadays where they fill so many video packages and so many... So much time is eaten up by wrestlers' entrances and stuff like that because they just can't be asked to tell any real stories. Yep. Um, but the this video package just shows what happened last week with Kurt Angle 
Paul Heyman and Big Show beating up Brock Lesnar at the end of the show. Um, but commentary like reliably inform us that that's not the full story. As they say, there's more to the Lesnar and Angle story than meets the eye, and they're going to show what happens between Lesnar and Angle later on in the program. So they're Why teasing us. Why would you not show it? Yeah, that's, See, that, that, that's... That, was one, that was one of the first things I wrote. But at least, at least they're teasing something on the show. So you're like, okay, I'll stick around to watch this then if they're not going to show it straight away. I think it's weird that you wouldn't be like, oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, you have to see what happened after we went off the air. Of course, they would never do that now because it would just be like, digital exclusive, look at what happened between Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle. Mm. Yeah, so how did you feel about the Christmas theming of this episode? It is what it is. Like, I kind of liked it. See, for me, when I look at Christmas wrestling shows, I go... Ah, uh, this one will be a big one. You know, like, you can almost feel like it's skippable if it's a holiday-themed show. Oh, that's true, but I did like the like the snowflakes in the background when they would do transitions and stuff like that, and the little jingle, uh, like, like let's say, the, um, the Christmas lights surrounding the nameplates and stuff like that. I it was, was definitely cool. better than the animated turkeys. Yes, a little bit better than the animated turkeys. Um... One other thing that I noticed was that they do they showed a graphic of it's meant to be Kurt Angle versus the big show for the ch- championship tonight. Or at least that's what they were originally advertising. And the image of show without the title belt clearly hasn't been updated since since before he moved to SmackDown. Yeah, because it's like his vengeance. Yeah, pretty picture. much, yeah. Which is yeah. lazy. But okay. <laughs> yeah, he's still wearing his old attire, he's still got the shaggier hair and stuff like that. So yeah, it just really doesn't look like a current version of the big show Which, but, i like that they did say going off the air last week that hey, it would be big show kurt angle yep but then stephanie comes down to the ring uh this is where i also noticed that justin roberts is doing the ring announcing for this episode so how long did they have him i have no idea i think that he was currently only coming in on a part-time or just a recurring not so much a recurring basis, but like if someone they could call on in certain areas to like, okay, if Tony Chin was not available, then we'll get you in as well. I don't think he was fully, fully under contract at this point. Right, because I, I just don't recall him before 06, but it's good to see that he was there. Yeah, so Stephanie says that that match between Angle and Big Show won't take place tonight. Boo. Brock- yeah. yeah, crowd start booing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to see two heels for for the WWE. Yeah, yeah, like a boo. Yeah, and that's all because of Brock Lesnar. Crowd disappointing. She says that because of what Brock Lesnar did to Angle, Angle might not be able to compete until Royal Rumble. Uh, she says that she'll show the footage of the attack later on, and then the question: Why well, don't show it now? But maybe they're just just trying to tease you in, just trying to say, okay, you need to stick around to watch this footage. Yeah, I guess so. It works. You know? Yeah, I guess there, there would have been less people that would have been scouring the dirt sheets at, at this point in time. There's more casual fans of WWE, so I'm assuming if you would have read like the dirt sheets or anything like that, or the Observer or anything like that, you would have figured out, okay, he attacked Kurt Angle, and you would have known all the details about it, but I guess at a time when there's less hardcores making up your main audience... You yeah, that's why your numbers thing. are four, damn near four, you know, like... It, it, it's understandable then. So Big Show comes down to the ring. He's not being accompanied by Paul Heyman, who apparently hasn't made it to the building yet. I always, I always like that little trope. It's like, you know, this is your job, right? Like, if yeah. you're just going to appear halfway through the show. I hate that. I know it's such like, a, they used to think like a cool thing. Oh my God, The Rock has arrived. Well, why isn't he already there? He's got to go to work. Yes. Um, he's wearing a lot of leather, the Big Show. Yeah. Leather jacket, leather pants. I've already mentioned I this look for the big show was so crazy. How many cows do you think he's wearing? <sighs> At least he got six. Good half dozen. Uh, show said that he didn't feel like waiting to speak to Stephanie. I didn't hear her name him as Angle's opponent at the Royal Rumble. He kind of goads her and he gets close up to her just to intimidate her. Uh, Stephanie tells him to back off because if he doesn't, then he'll end up suspended like Brock Lesnar. You know what's crazy is she's got more more balls when it comes to the big show than she does with Brock Lesnar. Yeah, well, Brock Lesnar is a star, so it's like <laughs> that's kind of, no, no, realistically, that's the kind of way it should work. Your big st- like main players, like your Austin, your Rock stuff, that they're the people that shouldn't be intimidated at all, and they should be the ones that intimidate 
the authority, but the authority need to again sto- show some sort of da- like dominance I, over I'll certain. I'll give you wrestling. that, except for the fact that Big Show is seven foot five hundred pounds. Yeah, true. Um, but Stephanie thinks the show needs to earn his title shot rather than be handed it straight away, which means I find it quite odd that why which, did they advertise? Where was she in November? Well, yeah, both in November, and also <laughs> why did you advertise a title match anyway? Like you had it on the screen at the start of it that you were going to do this title match. <laughs> And they said, no, nah, I thought about it. And you actually have to earn it instead. And you're going to fight Chris Benoit tonight and the winner will face Kurt Angle at the Royal Rumble. So Big Show rants about how Ben was nothing compared to him because he's a seven foot tall, 500 pound giant. I do, I do kind of, I don't say cringe, but it's a bit like weird that how much Big Show leans on the seven foot tall, 500 pounds. It's like, that's the only thing that his character is. That's all because when you strip it all away, yeah, he doesn't really have much else going for him at this point in time. Like, he's just big. Unfortunately, that's the biggest critique of the Big Show's career. The whole thing rides on, okay, yeah, he can be baby New Year next year or next week, but, like, then we could just say, well, he's seven foot four or 500 pounds, so be afraid. So Benoit comes out. Benoit says that Show has no idea what he's capable of. He threatens to break Show's neck and then make Show tap out to know it. I always mean, feels a little bit. What, what, it always feels a little bit weirder when you hear Benoit threaten people, and especially when he's just saying you have no idea what I'm capable of. But out of the, out of that 2007 context into the 2002 context, that's a tall task, quite literally, Benoit. You're just like, oh, I'm gonna break your neck. Yeah, if you yeah. can reach it. Yeah. Plus, <laughs> you you were just considered the vanilla midget, like. Two years ago, and they were like, "Okay, Mister Seven Foot Four, I'm gonna break your neck." Uh, show says that for that to happen, Benoit will need to take him down to Benoit's size to win. Uh, so Benoit kicks him in the balls. You know what? That is a solid move. If I was gonna ever, ever get in the ring with the Big Show, which would be a bad idea, that's my first move: hit him in the balls and hit him in the balls again, because everybody. Is affected by a swift shot to the testicles. Yeah, so Benoit laughs as Big Show grimaces in pain, and we move on to what well, after commercial we have our first match of the night, which is Build a Mop versus Crash Holly. Oh, I'm so excited, Callum. Well, it's building on from last week's episode. Oh, but yeah, this is but the I... match. That, this is a match that logically everyone wants to see at this point. They uh-huh. want to know what is Crash going to do after Build a Mop destroyed him last week. Mm. So, I know, that, that was the question on everybody's mind after last week's SmackDown. Yeah, so DeMore early on, like, prevents Crash from getting in the ring, so Crash just trips him out, pulls him out, gets kicked in the face, gets driven shoulder first into the ring post, just gets assaulted on his shoulder basically the entire match from that point onwards. I like the fact that the referee, like, because the referee, the match, they're beating each other up on the outside before the bell rings, and then he throws Crash in, and then the referee rings the bell, not even checking whether Crash is able to compete or not. They just, okay, ring the bell. <laughs> just like, let's go. <laughs> just like, I, d- I don't get, again, it's just some of these things that like, sometimes they check to see whether the wrestler's fine before they decide to start the match. They have to get the go-ahead from the baby face to get off these pre-match attacks. And sometimes they just go, yeah, fuck it. Just beat the hell, hell out of him. It. It's fine. It all depends on the story you're trying to tell. If you're trying to tell the story of a scrappy baby face, you know, we got to ask him first. If you're trying to just tell, oh boy, let's get the squash match over with, hey, ring the bell. You're fine. Yeah, so Crash misses an Inzaguri, Demot drops an elbow to the back of his head, pop up Powerbomb, Moonsault, Demot wins with Crash basically only outside of a few punches, really getting no offense in this at all. So, two two very sad points. Well, one very sad point, and then one I, I want to expand on. First thing, it's wild that less than a year later, Crash wouldn't even be with us anymore you know like mm. that sucks and then i think do you think that we're gonna build build a mot to the undertaker for wrestlemania no i i i hi, highly doubt he would have been the person playing undertaker for wrestlemania. because i, I mean, think he that... fits that year that like wild here's a train and here's nathan jones and here's big shit like that could have easily been and here's build a mot yeah, I don't necessarily think they had a huge plan for it. I think the plan was the Big Show because Big Show took him out. So I think originally their original idea would have just been Undertaker versus Big Show. And maybe for some reason they decided to make it a tag team match instead. Um, and then had to because they decided, oh, we can't trust this guy. Nathan Jones in the ring, so we have to make it a handicap match now instead. 
So it's like one of those things where they go, okay, let's have it Undertaker versus Big Show. But then they say, oh, these Nathan Jones guys, and we put in under Undertaker's wing. So when do we have Undertaker having his first ever tag team match at WrestleMania? You think, oh, that's great. Oh, Nathan Jones can't actually wrestle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. You know what's crazy about that is you have four people in that equation. And it's sad when American Badass Undertaker is the workhorse of this group. <laughs> I think that's a bit harsh on A-Train. Oh, I'm sure they weren't looking at A-Train. They are probably just like, maybe you can take the fall. <laughs> I would not have been surprised, though, if they were building Bill Demott to eventually fight Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship, though. See, I think that would have been good. You know, like, obviously we can't really say because Demott's push was shit. But I think it could have been fun if they would have stuck with that story. Uh, so pretty much immediately after the match is over, they cut to Dawn Marie backstage with Al Wilson talking about their wedding next week. Uh, Dawn says she got Al something, but Al has something for both of them first. Viagra. <laughs> Get it? He's old and his dick doesn't work. <laughs> uh, do you think? Do you think Vince McMahon had to sell Al Wilson on any of this? Or do you think Al Wilson was just enjoying himself? You think he really thought? Like, he was Mr. Cool. Look at me. I get to do this on TV. Well, I think, Rob, if you really want to be, like, having sex with your daughter's biggest rival, you shouldn't really go with Viagra. You should go with Blue Chew instead. I think you should go with Blue Chew. If only it existed in 2002, because you could have really gotten that Blue Chew spike. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Blue Chew really, really, code pipe. If you want to make sure you've got nothing to hide when you're getting married in your underpants... Then, <laughs> and maybe not even in your underpants. I think that was the last minute decision. Yeah. Um, so our opens Dawn's present. And it's a video camera, like one of those really old video cameras that. Oh, so, so this is like less than twenty years ago, and that video camera looks ancient. Yeah, that's just how ridiculous technology has evolved. Like you have to hold it pretty much almost like your whole hand. That's how bad how old school video camera it is. Uh, Dawn says they can now make movies of all of their adventures, including the entire honeymoon. Including his death! <laughs> um, yeah, you know? I, I do have to ask about that sort of thing, because they, they show the footage of all the video camera stuff. And then, but who's holding the video camera when Al Wilson dies? <laughs> it's like, it's Dawn, Dawn's in the shot. It's like, like, okay, who's holding the camera? Who, who have you paid to record your entire, like, honeymoon? Who knows? I, I imagine maybe they get a tripod with all that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll think we'll think about that. But uh, they make out as the footage cuts away, and then there's like an invitation graphic for next week's wedding. Everyone's invited to the wedding. Uh, uh, then they then show a still image of Angle being helped to the back by referees and producers as they continue to tease us with this footage. They they really they had nothing. <laughs> uh, God God bless them though. They're like we're gonna get our money's worth out of this footage. Uh, Matt Hardy comes out, who was, I'm reliably informed, the MVP of the 1999 No Mercy ladder match, and someone who always sticks to his New Year's resolutions. Matt uh, he... Hardy is so good at being a self-absorbed asshole. Mm. Well, he's, uh, essentially that's what his character is now becoming in AEW as well, so hopefully it's of the, a similar vein. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic. Yeah, so he comes out to the ring with uh, Shannon Moore, who still... Who's still hobbling to the ring, selling his attack from, from uh, Brock Lesnar last week? That was listen. That was an F five, the likes of which nobody has ever seen. Mm. I, I was more worried about the uh, the German suplex he took over the top rope to the floor. Well, then there's <laughs> that too. Um, Matt says that he talks about a problem that's destroying SmackDown. Brock Lesnar. They show the footage of Lesnar beating them up last week. Uh, Hardy gives more pep talk, saying that even though Brock Lesnar beat him, he didn't break Shannon Moore, and Shannon Moore should be super proud of himself for that. Um, he then challenges Brock to a one-on-one -on -one match for next week, saying Mattitude is going to another level. Um, he then proceeds to assault the hip of Shannon Moore and hit him with the microphone until referees come out to stop him. So I guess this, like, his display of, like, if anything Brock can do, I can do better. So if you can beat up Shannon Moore, I'll beat up Shannon Moore as well. Tough love, man. Tough love. Yeah, yeah tough love. Uh, Kurt Angle arrives to the arena on cr crutches. Uh, Hangman's with him. We, we should know by now why, but we still haven't seen this footage. No, we still haven't seen the footage, but we I guess we can get a, a sense that some, it was something to do with Angle's right leg. That's kind of what I'm getting out of this one. 
But Angle arrives, he's accompanied by Heyman. Heyman's basically just talking him up, saying, like, what inspiration he is for turning up, how amazing he is as an athlete for being able to support himself on crutches and come to the arena, even though he's badly injured. He pushes a production member out of the way as they walk down the corridor. So going to be hearing from them later on. But first, we have a tag team championship match. Los Guerreros defending the WWE tag team titles against Edge and Billy Kidman. Why does Paul Heyman like Billy Kidman so much? Was he supposed to be in ECW? Because Paul Heyman has gotten mileage out of Billy Kidman. I think they just thought that he was like a stable cruiserweight to hold the title for now, and but now they're giving him other matches. I mean, you say that you like him, that they like him a lot. He, they're just beating Kidman week in, week out at this point. <laughs> like he had a few good wins where he was defending the title every couple of, um, like basically every week. For a while, and then he got involved with the Guerreros, and now it's just losing, 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 losing. Yeah, I guess that is fair. So I saw a uh, sign which caught my eye, which was Eddie Guerrero's Christmas list: uh, a lawnmower, English lessons, and hair clippers. I the the start like just the, the blunt racism mm. in these Eddie Guerrero signs all year long have been a real interesting prospect. I will talk a little bit more about the Guerreros and racism in a segment later on as well, but I want <laughs> to. But let's get to this match itself. So, um, so there's there's some good work with uh, Kidman early on. So Chavo inadvertently lifts Kidman up into a drop kick on Eddie, and then then eats a head scissors from him instead. Uh, I noticed in this one, Kidman doesn't have very good punches. Yeah, it's, I mean it's it's something that's like there's, I guess characterized against a lot of wrestlers nowadays that they don't, they're not taught how to punch properly because it's more important to do the flippy shit. Well, I think with Kidman, I don't know if punching like punching became a thing when Cena was coming up as mm. a wrestler. Like, when Kidman was trained to wrestle I imagine that brawling style that became synonymous with the Attitude Era wasn't really a thing. So there's good uh, backbreaker helo combination by the Guerreros. Kidman escapes backdrop attempt, hits an Inzaguri, makes a hot tag to Edge. Edge runs wild for a while. Um, Eddie drop kicks the knee of Edge at one point, applies the lasso from a passo, but Kidman breaks up with a bulldog. Edge then hot shots Eddie on the top rope, hits the spear, Chavo breaks it up. Then they do something which essentially they did a couple of weeks ago, which is they grab the titles and they start to walk away, which is what they did in the Kidman Benoit match as well. Yeah, well, they're, they're tired of beating Kidman. Yeah, they want to go home. Oh, no, not in the Kidman-Benoit match. Sorry, it was the um, the Angle and uh, Benoit match. Basically, they're just fighting random teams at the moment, but they did that in that match. And essentially, Roberts announces that if they're counted out, they will lose the tag team titles. So basically, because the same I, gimmicks previously. I, and as you said, like, th these referees just fucking make up these rules as they go. Yeah. So after the break, Edge misses Spear in the corner, hits the shoulder into the turnbuckle. They then target the shoulder for a while until... Uh, Chavo's hit with an edge of uh, Eddie prevents the hot tag to Kidman at the last second, but then Edge hits a double flapjack, makes the tag, so Kidman's now doing the hot tag. Um, he uh, like he runs wild again for a little while until Eddie takes control. Uh, he avoids the frog splash, hits a Mekane bomb on Chavo, hits the shooting star press, but then Eddie pulls the referee out of the ring before he counts the three, and so they're disqualified. But it's still not over, because as the Guerreros go to leave again, uh, Robert says that the referee suspects that they're trying to get intentionally disqualified. Well, this is a ballsy referee. Yeah, Sherlock here. Um, <laughs> so now the match is going to restart as a no disqualification match. So Eddie now is crying with frustration about like how they're being screwed out of cheating to win the match. And um, they're both simultaneously knocked off the apron. Uh, Chavo is stupid enough to attempt a powerbomb on Billy Kidman because we always know how that goes. I believe uh, that always ends up with a face buster. I believe. Yeah, pretty much 90% of the time it's going to end up with a face buster. Eddie then fr throws into the floor when he's trying to do a uh, shooting star press, so Kidman's laid out on the outside. Uh, Chavo tries to hit Edge with the belt, but Edge ducks. He grabs the belt, hits Chavo with it. Uh, he tosses Kidman back into the ring to make the cover, but Eddie breaks it up at two. Uh, Kidman goes to make a tag, but Edge is pulled off the apron by the A-Train, who hits the back rake. Obviously, there's no DQ Because this moment. fucking guy doesn't want to go away. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. He's still hanging around. Uh, Eddie then hits the frog splash while Chavo has hold of Kidman's legs. And I really like that spot because obviously Kidman's just trying to get hold of Chavo, trying to see if he can do some more stuff afterwards because like, he's been beaten up and Chavo just got here with the title belt. 
but while he's reaching out to try and grab him, Eddie hits the frog splash. It's like really good finish, I thought. It's a yeah. fun match. There's loads of bells and whistles and there's loads of restarts, but overall it's nice to see a good long wrestling match on these shows. Uh, but I will say that thing with the referees, I just wish they were more consistent. Mm. You know, like if you can make that call for the baby face, then you know the heels do occasionally get screwed out of things. Happens all the time. Yeah, it it's just like it's something that just fits the moment rather than is constantly applied. Like, well, why do certain matches just end in the DQ and then it's done? Or why don't you restart it at that point or anything like that? I guess it's different for championship matches because if you get disqualified in just a n- normal match, it's not like there's anything on the line or anything that you're protecting. But they uh, should do it for more title matches, really. Yeah, and I just feel like it would give a lot more power to the referees. Yeah. Make them feel like they're more important rather than just being, you know, a schmuck in a zebra shirt. Are you ready, Rob? They're actually going to show the exclusive footage from after SmackDown. Holy moly, you mean like three quarters of the way through the show? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the it starts with the heels, uh, Angle and Big Show standing over a fool and Brock Lesnar. Uh, they attack Lesnar in the corner as Heyman screams how he hates Lesnar. But this spurs Lesnar into fighting back. He clotheslines show over the top ropes of the floor. Because uh, Brock up, Lesnar's a beast. Yeah, he beats up Angle for a while. Show tries to bring in a steel chair, but Lesnar kicks the rope as he's climbing over. So really... Um, uh, Big Show's testicles have seen quite a bit of abuse in the past two weeks. I know, poor guy, but again, that is the easy target. He then nails both of his rivals in the head with the steel chair, uh, beats up Angle at ringside. He then does an F5, sending Angle's knee into the ring post, which is a spot that soon becomes quite synonymous with Brock Lesnar. Yeah, and it's badass. Yeah. Then I did the one thing I did forget is that Brock Lesnar comes back when he's being checked on by the officials, and then he does... A knee drop onto the barricade. See, that's so, a little unnecessary. That's like a hat on a hat. Mm. But it, it's good because it shows the ruthlessness of Brock Lesnar. This spot, to me, would be a lot more effective later in the year when they finally turn him heel again. Yeah, I do appreciate when the crowd just starts chanting one more time after they hit Angle. Because the thing that I find good about that is that they've shown that... Because Angle was a baby face going into Armageddon, and now they're really against him and it's kind of in the next segment we'll talk about that as well but he his heel turn has been very very effective yeah and credit to the audience really for and it's gonna sound so stupid but we don't see it anymore even before covid like they really played their part very well here you know oh, yeah, this... go ahead i'll just say this is like a pantomime audience that we're gonna yeah, talk like, about right here very good and it it just makes the story flow that much better Right, so they cut back to the ring. Uh, Heyman's uh, kind of promo in the ring. He says that uh, he blames Stephanie for Angle's injuries by forcing Angle to go public about their working relationship. Uh, he introduces Angle. He basically says that he wants the fans to tone down the You Suck chants. And obviously what happens is Angle comes out and the You Suck chants are louder than ever. Of course. Uh, Angle struggles to get into the ring. Uh, he says he's amazed how Heyman stuck with a remorseless animal like Lesnar for so long. Uh, he then says Brock's only achieved everything he has because of Paul Heyman. He says they're both former NCAA champions. They both won the WWE title less than a year in the company. But Angle's different because Angle has an Olympic gold medal, if you didn't know. I didn't know that. I mean, that's so crazy. Um, and that's the thing that Brock will never do, which is, which is fair enough. But then again, okay, Angle was never the UFC heavyweight champion. So <laughs> Yeah. So they have some certain things over one another. Uh, Brock Lesnar was a TNA champion, though. Uh, no, but he was IWGB champion. You know, beat him oh, uh, uh, Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle uh, fought over the IWGP title. Not the not the one that they currently have, though. Interesting. That's, that's right. The one that looks almost identical to the TNA title mm. at the time. So the crowd. So basically, says he asked the crowd, "Who sucks now?" And then they all chant in unison, "You." It's like such, like there's a, there's a Christmas crowd here. There's a, like, they've just been see like Peter Pan or whatever at a show and they've just come out and just said, oh, we're going to be joining in on this as well. Great. That's awesome. Angle says that Brock is jealous of him. That's why he attacked. He says that, why is he jealous of Brock? Because he has an agent. It's like Michael Jordan has an agent, but Kobe Bryant doesn't attack him with a steel chair. Yeah. 
Um, Angle says that he needs an agent because he's a very important person. And nobody in the arena could ever understand the pressures that he faces as WWE champion. Wow. Um, this is this is so good because it's just paint by numbers wrestling. And again, it's like a lost art right now. Oh, no, this got to my favorite part of it where Angle says that... Um, Look, because Lesnar's so jealous, that's why he tore every cartilage in his knee. And then the bit that I love the most about it says, and right before Christmas. It's just, like, <laughs> just like, that is so good. That's such a great heel thing. It's just like, he's such a whiny arsehole, but it's so brilliant. I love that. Uh, yeah, he's getting a lot of heat from the crowd. He asks what the hell was the role with these people. He says that he will defend the title of Royal Rumble, but he'll never defend it against Brock Lesnar. He's never going to face Brock Lesnar. Uh, Heyman then... Heyman then Adds a little wrinkle into this by saying that there's a reason why Brock Lesnar will never get that close to Kurt Angle ever again because he has assembled his own project and that project is called Team Angle. Yep. Yep. You know what's so amazing about this segment? This is 2002. One of the guys who they bring out as like this young rookie blue chipper upstart Just is now a 40 is now a 45 year old man who is one half of the Raw Tag Team Champions. <laughs> In WWE, right this very Benjamin's second. 45? Currently? <laughs> wow. I believe he's 45. I, might, I, I hope I am not uh, overstating it too much, but he's definitely he's definitely on the other... Yeah, he's 45 years old. Wow. Um, unfortunately, the other half of Team Angle, Charlie Haas, has resurfaced recently. He don't look too good. <laughs> does he not? But, no, he does not. Uh, he... Uh, I guess he and Jackie recently got a divorce, but he looks like he's been through the mill. Uh, Shelton, still as big as ever, still a hoss, still great. I love Team Angle. I wish that this trio could have existed longer. Yeah, there's a the thing that amazes me about it, because obviously this is the formation. It's just before, like, in late, very late December 2002. And essentially Team Angle ends in, and obviously they continue as Team Angle afterwards, but because Angle goes away after WrestleMania 19 until about uh, May or June time, and he comes back as a babyface, then Team Angle is essentially over at WrestleMania. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Because like, we could have done so much stuff. Yeah. So Heyman talks up both these guys, talks about how they're both like, how loads of collegiate accomplishments, talks up the fact that Benjamin was Brock Lesnar's roommate in Minnesota, so that's like a little personal touch added onto it as well. Angle's just there, just smiling his ass off. He's just loving every second of him explaining it. Um, Angle says this is a great Christmas present. These guys clearly have respect, unlike everyone else in the crowd and unlike Brock Lesnar. Uh, Angle says that, yeah, Angle says wrestling is a game of human chess and Team Angle has just given him checkmate over Brock Lesnar. So yeah, this was a good introduction. I, I would kill for a storyline that is this simple and this focused in wrestling. And, uh, everything here is so smooth. And really, Team Angle were the perfect guys. These two guys were the perfect understudies for Kurt. No, but you're saying this wouldn't be better if like Team Angle would debuted and then thrown a Molotov cocktail at some part of the building and then worn <laughs> funny masks and worn Bane masks afterwards? Yes, and I'm also suggesting that even though something like the Tribal Chief is great, you can't just have the guy be the lackey that gets their ass kicked all the time and never wins anything. At least Team Angle is going to go on to be world champion. Or not world champion, but world tag champions. So Funaki is backstage reminding us that Dormarie will marry Al Wilson next week, and he's outside the women's locker room to find out if Tori uh, if Tori's going to be attending the wedding. So, but before we get to that uh, very exclusive interview, so they're making us teasing us with that as well. Like, oh, you better come, better stick around for this match if you want to hear that Tory interview. Um, it's Rikishi versus, well, how how do you want to refer to him? It's B two or B squared or Bling Bling Buchanan. It's got a lot of different names. We're gonna refer to him as released in about a month. Like... Yes. <laughs> So Cena cuts like he cuts quite a decent freestyle again, like highlighting B Squared's multiple names and why he has those different names. Then he hands the mic to B Squared just so he can say Booyah. Amazing. <laughs> Next week is... it'll be Booyah Buchanan. Mm. Uh, so the match starts with Rikishi. Uh, B Squared tries like a quick attack. Rikishi fights him off. Cena's on commentary, 
um, as Rikishi beats up B squared. This is when I noticed that obviously B squared, when he takes his hat off, like the beanie cap, like that is one of the most unflattering hairstyles you can ever give to somebody. Like, yeah, like, this, poor, this poor guy. Like bleach blonde at the sides, but he's got a very definitive ball patch at the start of it. It's just like, there yeah, doesn't doesn't fly for me. Um, for anybody? <laughs> nah, Cena gets up from uh, commentary to help B squared out of the corner so he doesn't eat the stink face. Uh, Rikishi intimidates Cena at the announce table. This allows B squared to hit his very athletic springboard clothesline from the top turnbuckle. Uh, Rikishi then uh, just about elevates B squared over the top rope at one point. He's like, he struggles to get him over. Um, looks like he gets like quite a rough landing coming down as well. Uh, Cena, uh, Rikishi punches Cena. Referee stops Cena bringing in the chair. He, he uses this distraction as the referee is trying to get the chair out of his way to toss, toss a chain to B squared. B squared misses with the chain. Rikishi kicks him near the corner, hits the banzai drop, gets the victory. Again, enough, Rik- again. Rikishi is. It's so shocking to me that he didn't do more. But, yeah, so that was just a, a quick, pretty nothing happening match with that one. Uh, but more importantly, Funaki's backstage with Tori Wilson uh, to ask her whether she'll be at the wedding. Uh, she says that she doesn't know. It's a great answer there. Uh, <laughs> really exclusive, must-know information. Uh, but she can't believe that Alison hasn't seen through Dormarie's schemes yet. Yeah, uh, um, I can't believe that we're still touching the bare minimum of questioning here. Hey, are you happy about this situation yet that you haven't been happy about for like three months? Mm. Uh, Funaki then get asked to comment on Al Wilson breaking her heart, but before she can even give any sort of an answer, Al Wilson arrives. Al says that it's always been about Tory, 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 but like next week he's going to be doing something for himself, and after they're married, <laughs> they're going to raise a child. <laughs> well. Unfortunately, uh, science says that somebody his age probably could have sire child. And that he hopes it doesn't turn into a disappointment like her. <sighs> That's the sort of, they they do this a lot, really. This, um, this whole, like, Stephanie calling Linda a bitch and stuff like that. It's just, like, people yeah. like to have, like, parents and children with really, like, it's very soap opera. Yeah. This fractious relationship with their parents. The thing that sucks here is like Al Wilson's just a guy. He's like he's a real guy. It's gotta be pretty harsh for him not to say to his daughter, yeah. You know? mm. So we see Eddie and Charo celebrating backstage, and then they walk into Cena and B Squared and mock them in both English and Spanish. Um Charo then says that they've worked for everything and they didn't have it handed to them, which I don't really kind of get the reference of that yet, really. <laughs> Like, well, I, maybe it's like, hey, John, screw you. You just showed up on Smack. Like, maybe he's still mad about it. Yeah, so Cena gets rolled up. Charo then tells him to calm down, saying this shouldn't become an East Coast, West Coast thing. Or for Cena to become another, and I'm quoting this, rap statistic. Okay. Which I can only assume means, oh. hey, man, you don't want to get shot like all those other rappers have. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Uh, they then put on what I can only assume are their white people voices, and they mm-hmm. like they mock Cena a little bit, so things like "word to your mother" and stuff like that. So let's see, let Cena tell his people that they're still the champions. Very, um, I, I guess, very stereotypical. I, I, well, we know that Chavo can put on a good white accent. We we would find out when he becomes Kerwin White, but mm. I'm surprised that they let this. Like, just drag out for so long. I've never really forgiven that act for one salient reason, is that it introduced Dolph Ziggler to the mainstream audience. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. So, and he's still on our screens, like, 15 years later. <laughs> uh, so, I guess they're, uh, they're, I guess they're in the process of turning the Guerrero's face now. After yeah. they basically just cheated the entire match previously. Very weird face turn. I I, yeah. I don't get it. Like... Very strange. Well, I guess it, it it makes sense for what they have planned going forward, that they have to be baby faces. It's just, if they're going to make them baby faces, why didn't you just have them, I don't know, win the match fairly cleanly against Benoit, not uh, Edge and Kidman, rather than have them just constantly cheat, even though I guess their entire baby face stick eventually surrounds the fact that they cheat in every match. Yeah, and we haven't seen like the vignettes yet where they're just like, 
lying and cheating and stealing, which is weird that they, I never thought about this, but they start running vignettes on them after, like, anywhere has been on our TV sets for years. Why are you running vignettes on who they are as people now? I don't think there's like a there's like a time limit attached to that sort of thing. I know that it's something that most commonly would be done for a debuting wrestler or someone that we don't know a huge amount about. But I think it's something that could be. I think it's something that more wrestlers nowadays would benefit from. I don't agree. Like this whole shitty Angel Garza just putting a rose to the camera or anything like that. It needs to be something that's actually decent. I would agree with that. I think unfortunately the last guy they got like a good vignette build was Doria. Yeah, absolutely. It, it needs to be something that you just need to learn more about whoever the char- character is, because it's one of the bigger issues with WWE nowadays, just that a lot of people that are wrestling WWE are just people that, like, we just see, the only things we know about them and stuff that we see just them do in the ring or stuff like that, they don't they don't explore their characters enough. I agree with that. I just think it's, like I said, I just think it's weird that they decided to do that after we've known who they are for so long. Uh, so Benoit has a promo of Josh Matthews saying that size doesn't mean a thing to him and he'll prove it against Big Show next. Uh, he then talks passionately about his sacrifice to become WWE champion and how he knows that he's better than Angle. But then it starts to meander as a lot of Benoit promos usually do. <laughs> just like He's just saying things now and thinking, OK, you probably should have ended this promo 30 seconds ago. Let's go, buddy. Can you... Wasn't... Uh, they were supposed to put him in with Benoit mm. instead of Lester. I think you know the what? world would have been better off. <laughs> like, I think Heyman could have gotten a different side of Benoit out there, and maybe, I don't know, Benoit wouldn't have felt the need to overcompensate with all those uh, enhancements. Maybe, to a degree. Um, Angles uh, gives Big Show a pep talk backstage, saying that Show's been the champion and Angle can't wait to face him at the Royal Rumble. He says that obviously because of the injury, he can't help show physically tonight, but he'll be there in spirit. You jerk. <laughs> uh, so now we have main event, Chris Benoit versus Big Show, number one contendership at the Royal Rumble on the line. Uh, I love the fact that commentary at this point, and I think they mentioned it maybe a couple of minutes beforehand, but now they mentioned the fact that Big Show's that not, Brock Lesnar's not on the show tonight. And that's kind of like a good, I guess it's a good way to say it right at the end. It's like, okay, we've already had you watching for a good 90 minutes into the show, and now you realise Brock Lesnar's not turning up, so you can turn it off now. We've got most of your viewership. Oh, and Brock's that's cool up. too, though, because like, if the ratings for that segment were going to be low, it would have been like, oh, well, Benoit's not a draw. You know, that sucks. So Benoit drop kicks, uh, shows he steps over the ropes, starts firing chops until... Show throws him in the t- corner, hits a couple of like his huge overhand chops of his own. Uh, he throws him Benoit all the way across the ring with a massive beal. Like Benoit took a, a nasty bump for that. Yeah. Um, and Show starts just dominating him with side, his size game. He dropped Benoit face first from a military press position. Uh, Benoit starts taking multiple Bret Hart bumps out of the turnbuckle. Because I think I'm convinced somebody was watching. A Bret Hart match once, and they were just like, "Yeah, let's just go. Like, let's. We're always gonna do that Bret Hart bump." Uh, show escapes across face, face attempts, hits a sidewalk slam. He then removes the top turnbuckle pad. Uh, he whips Benoit towards it, but Benoit slides under the bottom rope. Uh, show then chases him around ringside. When he gets back in, Benoit is now on top of him, and he has the upper hand because Show is a stupid giant that is too reckless. Yep. Uh, Benoit suplexes Show. Oh, yeah, which then, oh, it was a German suplex. I have to talk about this German suplex because it was just incredible. Uh, because he German suplexes the Big Show, which is essentially Big Show just jumping a few feet in the air and falling backwards. And he almost lands on top of Benoit because of just how huge he is. I just thought, listen, I'm all for like trying to show Benoit. And the crowd did respond to it and you'll say, oh, Benoit can even suplex the Big Show, how amazing he is. But there is a certain level of disbelief that you kind of can't even suspend even for wrestling. I would agree. You know, I, I know what they wanted to do, but I'll say it again. I think, like, that probably hurt a guy like Benoit probably being expected to do stuff like that every time he's wrestling a guy like the Big Show. Come on. Benoit and... probably show being like, you see, I can get up there. I can do missile dropkicks. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, Benoit then goes for the headbutt. Because Big Show, his position on the mat is so close to the turnbuckle, Benoit hits a splash instead. Now I look at that and go, why didn't you do that all the time? It would have been so much safer. <laughs> because you wanted to be dynamite. Yeah. Yeah, well, he turned out worse than that, even. That <laughs> yeah, was, uh, that's, uh, so. some of it's, that's, that's really <laughs> saying something as well. Um, so, Show charges Benoit towards the corner, but uh, Benoit drop kicks him in the knee, sends him face first into the turnbuckle. Uh, Show then attempts a choke slam, but Benoit rolls through with a headlock, gets his feet onto the ropes, and he pins the big show. Makes sense. It does you make know? sense, but, but there is a, also a degree of thinking, okay, so big show's now, like, a month now back into being on SmackDown. He's now back to being what he was when he was on Raw. Yeah, but they rehabbed him. Don't you know, he was just world champion. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so post match, Furious Show tries to choke slam him, but Benoit reverses that into the crossface, forces Big Show to chap- tap out. Then Team Angle arrive to make the save. They attack Benoit. Then they do a couple of things which kind of just show, okay, this is a team that I might be interested in, which is a few double team moves, which is the super kick into a German suplex combination. Yeah. And then a powerbomb uh, clothesline, top rope clothesline. Like a uh, combination as well. I like uh, the fact that they right out the gate, we're just going to show you our moves. So you're like, yeah, these guys. Yeah, so Haas locks in a uh, Huss of Pain onto uh, uh, Benoit while uh, Benjamin's like kicking him from the side. They give him over to Big Show. Show hits a stalling choke slam, just holding Benoit up for a few seconds before sending him down. Uh, Team Angle then drags him all the way up the ramp on his knees where they meet Angle at the top. Angle trash talks him. Benoit tries to kick out of him, so Big Show then just boots Benoit in the face, which looked like it sucked. Um, ah. Angle then choke. Oh, go ahead. No, no, keep going. I just wanted to comment. I'm like, they're doing, they're doing so much, knowing that like this is going to be the build to the show because Angle can't do anything. Mm. But Angle chokes him with the crutch. He stands tall with the heels surrounding him as the show ends. So. Benoit is going to be have to, fighting a uh, a big battle if he's going to be dealing with uh, all these odds against him. But overall, I kind of I pretty I I quite enjoyed the show. I think it was mainly due to the tag match and the main event and the angle that's been built out of it, the team angle stuff, the Kurt Angle promo that was all really good. All the rest of it was kind of blah. But if there's some good, if there's enough good stuff in the show, then I'm likely to feel more positive about it coming out of it. I liked it. I actually feel like. They didn't. They didn't do what they will do and just go. Just wait until next year, folks, because we're gonna kick it off big. Like they, they had a nice set of stories, and they're just playing directly into them as we go to the new year. And with that, that's an end to uh, 2002, guys. SmackDown in 2002 is over. We'll be moving on to 2003 very shortly. But as an overall kind of sense of what you've seen from the 2002, how how do you how have you felt about SmackDown? So, some of it really holds up. Like, you know, you look at matches like Andrew Zeddy Guerrero, uh, Benoit and Angle against Edge and Mysterio, two out of three falls, the, the Fatal 4 Way, the, the number one contenders match. Some of that really holds up. Then there's some gems that you've forgotten about, right? Like The Rock in mm. the summer of 2002 killed it. He went out on his shield. And. Then I think a lot of this really goes, why was I allowed to watch this as a kid? Such as Corey Wilson. So a mixed bag of emotions, but overall I'm kind of impressed with how well it held up. Yeah, I've been enjoying it so far. It's definitely been a breath of fresh air from WWE's current programming and stuff like that, which obviously helps. But just seeing things like Cena's rise and subsequent like just stuttering in his early stages of his WWE career, uh, the Matt Hardy version one stuff has been great. The uh, the the build towards like Undertaker and Brock Lesnar was a bit like lopsided, but you know some bits of it were really good. The rehabbing of the Big Show and then what seems to be his going back down the card at this point, but all the stuff surrounding the SmackDown Six is great. It's definitely worth watching back. So yeah, I think overall this has been an enjoyable experience, and obviously we still got another two months to go and hopefully you'll be joining us for all this journey as well of course we'll be checking out the if you are check out the patreon if you're at the ten dollar tier or above then 
you'll hopefully be looking forward to the Royal Rumble review we'll be doing soon. We only have three pay-per-view reviews left in the can. It's Royal Rumble, No Way Out, and then WrestleMania 19 as an extra special one at the end of the at the end of this journey. But uh, yeah, so hit us up there on the Patreon if you want to be getting in all that exclusive dark cost content at ten dollars or above. But of course, if you can only spare a buck, a buck would be just amazing as well. Again, as we always say, if everyone who is subscribed to the channel just pays a, a dollar into it, then Tony would be able to do so much more with the content. We'd be able to do so much more as well. So always encouragement if you are able to help out in any way, shape or form. But of course, there are other ways that you can help us monetarily. There's the Patreon, obviously, and the YouTube applause features and membership as well. But other than that, you can also check out the merchandise shop on Redbubble and Public. pick up some smart amount of merchandise, get it straight to your hand. If you can't help us monetarily, then that's totally fine, but we could help us by just in a completely free way, which is just clicking the like buttons, clicking share buttons, sharing us through all your social media channels and things like that, just letting people know how much you're enjoying what we're doing right now. Uh, check out the articles on the website, smartcomemoment.com. You can like and share those as well, just... All the weekly stuff that's going out, all television reviews, or any other like bits and pieces that we're throwing out there. You can follow the Fantasy League on there as well. Other than that, you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter. Join the Mega Maniacs on Facebook, our big like Facebook group where you can join like-minded wrestling fans in commenting wrestling, share a wrestling meme here or there. Uh, follow us along when we're reviewing shows and got the little uh, chats going on there where you can just drop a comment below if you're watching a show tell us how bad it is tell us oh my god they set the fiend on fire all this other amazing stuff yeah. just like um <laughs> yeah so rob do you want to throw out your stuff because uh yeah now quite um, exclusive pretty much i am pretty much faithful exclusive i will be with russell zone at least to the end of the year but i am very much a fightful exclusive so check me out there monday really awesome days of the week uh check out fightful select I also want to go back and mention, you know, check out the most recent thing we did, which will be the Slammy Award coverage and the AEW Awards, and we're also building towards our end of the year awards, which will be a fun time. Get in on the feedback survey on the website. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see more of, less of. And really, you can just follow me on Twitter at Dude Felice, and I will see you guys in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. So just forgot to mention it'll see as well. If you want to help Tony out in particular with the Fanboys Anonymous stuff, fanboysanonymous.com. Check that out. Check them out on Patreon. Check them out on Facebook, Twitter, Redbubble, Tea Public, all the other great stuff as well. If you're into geek culture stuff, that is the destination for you. Um, obviously, next week we'll be in 2003 as well as well, 2021 as well. So happy new year for us back then. But um what we'll be talking about is obviously the big story is the Dormery and Al Wilson wedding. So we'll be covering that. So lots to look forward to there. Other stuff, um, Brock Lesnar versus Matt Hardy. Um, Team Angle's debut as well. So definitely a lot of stuff to look forward to there. So hopefully you'll be joining us. I hope you enjoy that episode as well. And yeah, we'll see you in the new year. We'll see you both in 2003 and in 2021. That's right, and here's hoping that it just gets a lot better from here. Yeah, it can. At least for the 2020 side of things, it can only go up. But That's uh, right. But for now, this has been another Smart Out moment, and we are being counted out. 